Hey everyone, Igor and Benji here at the Contractor Revolution Studio. One of the greatest fears most contractors have is that they're going to work their ass off for 25 years and at the end of it have a business that isn't worth anything and that nobody wants to buy. The sad reality though is that this is how many landscaping, construction, roofing, and painting companies are put to rest. Now one surefire way to avoid this is to adopt the mindset of an implementer. A business owner who embraces the implementation of systems, technology, and procedures not only ends up with a highly valuable asset they can sell in the end, but they also make the running of their business 10 times more fun in the short term. Having a fully developed management system in your business gives you options. It makes your company more scalable in revenue, it makes it more profitable, it frees up your time, and it allows you to create a role for yourself that plays to your strengths and to your own unique entrepreneurial abilities. Today, our guest on the show is Jason Hoke. Jason is the owner of A Cut Above Landscaping. They're a Denver, Colorado-based landscape maintenance contractor. Now, since buying the business, he's created massive change both in the company and also in his lifestyle. He's gone from working all day, every day. This guy, he's literally sleeping on the office couch for months and months on end. And he's gone from that to now having a very balanced lifestyle, working a totally manageable 40 hours a week. He's experiencing the kind of freedom that most contractors want. Now, he bought a business that was consistently losing money every year, and in just a couple short years, he's turned it into a profitable enterprise. While turning it around, he's tripled the number of employees, and they're now servicing over 10,000 jobs a year, which is very impressive. One major influence that drove this drastic improvement has been an exceptionally strong implementation of systems, of processes, and infrastructure that underpins all the operations in his company. So much so, in fact, that he's been awarded Breakthrough Academy's Implementer of the Year Award in 2020. So let's dive into it with Jason Hoke and learn how to become a master implementer. You're watching Contractor Evolution, where we unpack the systems, tactics, and skills you need to take your fast-growing contracting business to the next level. You're here to learn what it takes to scale up, work less, and increase profitability. You've come to the right place. Stay tuned to learn what separates the new breed of contractor from the old school and welcome to your ultimate guide on the business of contracting. Jason, good afternoon. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Awesome. Really awesome. good. Hey, man. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Um, so I want to get right into it, man. We got a lot of stuff to talk about today. Uh, we're just coming off of a, a huge win for you, which was getting the 2020 Implementer of the Year Award at our Breakthrough Academy Winter Summit. Uh, like the, the list of systems that you have implemented into your business over the last few years is pretty uh, jaw dropping. Uh, and we're going to get into a lot of it today. But I, I thought we'd begin just by like asking you this. You know, this stuff takes work. It takes discipline. It takes time. It's not easy. Where did the deeper motivation to take all of this on come from for you, Jason? Yeah, uh, for me personally, that deeper motivation was really just like working my way out of the day to day. Um, I I started at this business actually as an employee prior to owning it. Um, so I'm not the founder of this business. I started here when I was 15 years old. Um, kind of just worked my way up and then eventually bought the business five years ago. Um, and <laughs> that first year or two of ownership was much like being an employee, if not worse. Like I was just in the day to day, every single day in the grind. And, um, it wasn't really ultimately what I was looking for. What I was looking for was a bit more freedom in my life, uh, being able to really focus on the things that I enjoy doing, um, within the business and, so it was clear that I needed to do something to create some consistency there. Beyond that, as we grew, um, just the old way wasn't really manageable anymore. Uh, you know, it's it's certainly manageable when you're the one out in the field kind of calling all the shots and, and moving individuals around. But uh, when you want to grow past that point and have multiple teams out there that just know what to do and how to execute, there's got to be some sort of standardization and, and some sort of like uh, – um, just kind of systemization. So that was, that was the big driver for me. Yeah. It's a really interesting point. Jason makes like that in my business career has been a lot of the similar pattern that, that I've always found. And the question I've always asked myself is like, do I want to be doing this stuff forever myself? 
And, and I noticed so much in the contracting industry is, is, is like, it's all just repeatable stuff. We tend to do very similar things over and over again. And, um, yeah, that, that's, that, that, that's been my experience too, is that, that if you really want to scale and you want to take pressure off of your own shoulders, you have to implement structure and systems and replicable processes that people will follow over and over again. Um, otherwise it's always sits on you or at best your management team. And the other thing is that your business also typically won't have a ton of value, Mm. right? That's a really big factor too. I think a lot of people don't really think about that, uh, especially during like the growth stage of a business. Not early on, probably not not early enough, not early enough. Right. (laughs) And the reality is that everyone will sell the organization. Like you're not going to die with it, so to speak. So even if, you have no plan to do so eventually this will happen and you're you are absolutely best building it from the early days in such a fashion and and always keep that front of mind that you're not going to be owning this and running it till the day that you die which means that if the business is going to have is to have some sort of value it has to be valuable without you because it has really no the any buyer won't have any interest or any value in it if it revolves around you. Yeah. It's like, it comes up a lot. I, I, um, not, I, I see it a decent amount in, in assessments. And when we're kind of talking to people about, about breakthrough Academy and, and they're, um, you know, later in their business career and they're, they're starting to think about retirement they're starting to think about selling this thing, or they're thinking about handing it off to some employees and they're working out some arrangement. And, and, um, it's tough because sometimes you're like, man, this, this business is literally you like this is not mm-hmm. you're not handing anything off to anyone like it's your name and your phone number and the entire thing circulates around your person and so that's not really an asset that is super desirable and and uh yeah that's one of the things i really admire about you jason is like you're still a really young guy and you're you've taken this full on and taken it very seriously and have made a huge amount of progress in a short yeah. period of time. Now, the one thing I do want to highlight though, is there, we all in the contracting space should feel really lucky about this one fact, which is we don't do, we're not, let's say authors of books. That's right. not our business. Like you don't really systemize writing a book, right? But what you re- like, this is a business that is absolutely syst- systemizable. And I know a lot of people in the audience would be like, look, well, my complex construction right. company does this <laughs> and this and this kind of custom stuff. But, there, but if you're really honest with yourself and you look at from from you know the first minute that your employees show up to the last before they go home there's a lot of stuff in there that happens over and over again and um and i I do just want to highlight that i think that some gratitude needs to be had in our industry for how replicable totally uh, we do have things like we do have things in our in in our industries yeah jason i I thought it'd be good uh just for the listeners to no, like, can you summarize what some of the big um, implementation items were over the last few years? I mean, we don't have time to get into all 75 or whatever, but like, what are the, what are the main ones that you've seen the biggest ROI from? Yeah, the, the biggest, probably the biggest impact that we've seen has come from really like a handful of implementation items. They've all been helpful in their own way, but the biggest ones that come to mind are, uh, probably our our meeting rhythm, like we we really we needed to structure like how we were passing data um, from one team to another as we grew, um, and so it became important to really set out like what our structure for meetings were, what type of meetings we had, and what rhythm we met on. Um, as we grew, it, we had a tendency to just kind of hop into like super long meetings where we felt like we needed to just like get everything on the table and cover everything at that moment right then and there. And it was like death by meeting uh, for a little while there. So it became really important to hone that in, uh, figure out exactly what was the objective of our meetings. And then as we did that, we started to identify um, kind of to Igor's point, like even this is repeatable. Like (laughs) we could have a very like standard meeting once a day and it only needs to take 10 to 15 minutes. And that's, that's all we need. Um, So we really, we hone that in. We have a, goal setting and review meetings weekly. Uh, we have a daily standup that we do each division does a daily standup meeting, which is basically a key performance indicator check-in um, every single day. 
And then we do uh, a retro at the end of each week. Uh, the retro basically is a really simple meeting. It tends to be a bit longer of a meeting, but we just ask four simple questions. What went well? What didn't go well? What, what do we want to keep doing? And what do we want to change? And it allows us, like, agility is super important to our business, um, as we've kind of all learned over the course of the last year, especially. Um, you can be like things are going to get thrown at you and it's really important to be agile and be able to move and be able to pivot. And so that's kind of the purpose of that meeting rhythm is for us to really be able to be agile. Um, so that's a big one. Uh, employment agreements was a huge one for us. Um, employment agreements, just being able to really clearly define like who owns what in the business, who owns what accountabilities. Um, and, that was crucial for that kind of working me out of <laughs> wearing every single hat in the business. Um, if I was going to ask other members of my team to kind of take some of that off my plate, I had to clearly identify what it was I was asking them to do mm -hmm. and how we were going to measure whether they were doing that well or not. Um, so, so that was a really big one for us. And then finally, the most recent ones our training program. Uh, we have spent really the last year developing what I think is a really like standout training program. Um, and it's, it's had immediate impact in our business. Um, it's, it's been very substantial. And then also our sales process, same thing. We really dove into our sales process. It was something that used to just be me, as I'm sure a lot of contractors experience, like just me out there pounding the pavement, uh, meeting with clients, putting together bids, um, and we've really systemized that so that it doesn't need to be me all the time. In fact, it doesn't even really need to be a person anymore. Uh, we've automated a lot of our sales process. So those are the big ones. Cool. Yeah. And just to clarify one thing that, that Jason said, that he's, he's referring to employment agreements. Um, from our conversations before, Jason, these are not just like the legal side of employment agreements. There's like a deep job description focus within them, right, where you're defining each individual's like within their role, their right. goals, like what do they need to deliver that year to the organization, their full list of accountabilities, right? Just t tell me a bit more about like what, what is encompassed in there. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the employment agreement uh, that we use in our company really isn't even a lot of that legal side of things. We use uh, kind of a separate handbook for that. The employment agreement, really, we look at as a, look at it as a roadmap um, for, each role. Um, so what are the key deliverables that that role um, is responsible for? So an operations manager has very specific, usually three to five deliverables that they're responsible for. Same with a technician or a crew lead. Um, and then we break it down further from there into accountabilities. So for each of those three to five deliverables, what are the accountabilities that go into achieving that deliverable? And that's where we really think of it like a roadmap. Like if you do these things, if you hold yourself accountable to doing these things, that's going to put you on the right track to meet that deliverable. Um, and so we, we actually use those employment agreements quite regularly throughout the year. Um, in our regular GSR meetings, we visit those employment agreements. If we're having an issue, like we're, we're falling short of a particular KPI, the first thing we do is usually pull out that employment agreement mm. and just kind of go through those accountabilities. Like, are we, how do we feel we're performing on this accountability and this one and this one? Oh, you need further training on this. That probably has something to do with why we're, we're not hitting that KPI. So right. this is very different than sort of a generic company wide handbook that everyone like blindly totally. signs on their way <laughs> in the door. Like this is, this is different. Yeah. It's very particular to that, to that individual's role. Now, yeah, I want to ask a, a, a question just generally speaking about all this is, you know, people, the thing that I hear often is there's so much to systemize. It just seems like a huge undertaking. When you look at the average contracting business, there's so much that happens between like all the, operations and administrative stuff at the office between marketing, sales, production. Um, it can seem like a very daunting thing. And it is right. Like I've, I've spent a year and a half building a 400 page operations manual. Right. Um, so I totally get it. Now, my question to you, Jason, is how did you figure out where to start and what to implement first, where to begin to not make it so daunting? Yes, that's a really great question. I think one of the thinking back to early on when I first started kind of like implementing some of these changes and systems into our business, the biggest thing honestly was just what is going to have the biggest impact for me personally? Like what are the mm -hmm. things that I, I kind of just listed out? Like 
all the different things that take up the bulk of my time um, and started that it was a good starting point. Like, and then it was what's going to have the biggest impact um, and free up the most time for me. Cause I knew there's an endless amount of things like that was clear. And I think that's generally clear for most contractors. Like there's so many things that you can improve in your business. Always there still is. And uh, you know, my goal was like, let's focus on some things that are going to have big impact right away that are going to free up time so I can focus on some other things and I can kind of just keep the ball rolling that way. That was a big part of it. Um, another key thing that like was really important to me is just making sure that whatever I was going to choose was aligned with the kind of greater why, um, both personally for me and for the company. Um, for us, you know, at our company, our why is really to just improve the human experience. So, um, you know, on the client side, that means adding hours back to their day. Like we're selling more than just yard mowing, we're selling time. Um, we're taking something off their to-do list so they can focus on something else that they care more about. Um, that helps us out quite a bit uh, to kind of stay aligned with that. Internally, it's all about growth. Um, and we're focused on, you know, improving the experience for everyone that walks through our doors. We want to create an opportunity where they can um, really follow the same path, not to a T, but have the same opportunity, I should say, that I had. Mm -hmm. um, I started out as a technician, then I was a crew lead, then I was a manager and a general manager, and then I was able to purchase the business from the previous owner. Ideally, I want to create that same level of opportunity for everyone that comes in our doors. So we're still working toward that. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a big kind of lofty why, um, but I want to make sure that anything that we're tackling is aligned with that. If it's not going to get us to that objective, then it, it's not going to be something that's prioritized. Yeah. You know, what's interesting too about this is it like, um, this is a mindset to adopt a way of being rather than like a final destination. Like totally. that's like something that sh listeners should take note of. Like, this this will never be done like you will it's just like yeah. you'll, you'll like the system that you maybe want to implement this year will make some changes and fix a few things and then something else will crop up the year after or you or you'll just want to get better so it's not so much like i need to get all these systems in place and then i'm kind of done and can just like chill on the beach and the business will run itself like i think that's a bit of a pipe dream it's it's more of just like it is yeah it's a, it's a perspective to have and a, and a mindset to have about your business which is which is to be constantly improving constantly finding those areas where things are under systemized or they're disorganized or you're finding your time slipping away or you're seeing your profit you know fall through your hands like that's that's kind of a really interesting perspective to have now Igor, like you've got some good advice on just how to go about um, prioritizing as well. Like for, for someone that's maybe never done this before and they're looking at their business and the overwhelming list that you kind of rattled through there again, are there simple steps you could follow to just get clarity on what to do first, what to do second, and so on? Totally. Yeah, to, to Jason's point, he talked about ROI, right? And asking the question at the beginning, where am I going to get the most amount of ROI? Like what do I need to go and apply like a structure, a system, like some rules, whatever you want to call it too. Um, another way to look at it um, is is where do I have the biggest pain points currently, right? right? So I remember, so let's say, I, so it, I've, I ran a company and, and systemized the crap out of it in, in this very production complex, what we call like a house detailing industry with window cleaning, gutter cleaning, pressure washing. It's very logistically complex. It's like five jobs a day per crew, per mm -hmm. van, Many of them, many of them running around every day in each division, um, and and one of the things that that I remember early on is, is the vans were coming back very disorganized. And when you're doing four or five jobs a day, the logistical like movement from one job site to another to another to another, the efficiency that's very important. And clearly, one very low hanging piece of fruit is how tidy those vans were right. kept between jobs and at the end of a day so that they're ready to go for 7.30 a.m. the next morning. And to apply a rule book, a system, a process, whatever you want to call it, inside of the beginnings of the operations manual in and around what you have to do between jobs, like a five-minute tidy up, and then at the end of the day for like 20, 25 minutes so that that vehicle's ready to roll for the crew the next morning was relatively easy and was a low-hanging piece of fruit, right, of how we can get 
quite a lot of gains very easily. And I really do think that that's kind of the best way to start is, is by asking yourself like, you know, so the way that Jason put it, where do I have a lot of ROI? But you can also just look at it. Where do I feel a lot of pain? Like, what am I constantly talking to my employees about? Right. What do I get pissed off with? Right. What might customers be annoyed with? And just really start there. Right. Um, and then and you can write out all those things. Right. What are those ones? What are what are the ones that are constantly regularly repeated? Um, and, and then and then sit with that list, sit with it for a few weeks, for a month and see what are the things that keep coming up on that list. Right. You can have it with you in your phone, in the notes um, and, and let that run for a couple of weeks. And chances are you'll see a bit of a recurring pattern of the things that you keep being annoyed with customers keep being annoyed with where you see opportunity, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then, and then once you have that, you order it by importance, right? That list, and then just start right off the top. Um, uh, which one, which of these gives you the biggest headache, your customers, the biggest headache and, and start with that one and then figure out who on your team, in addition to you, of course, has some expertise in that area and say, okay, what is the best way to do this? Like if we're going to have a daily vehicle tidy up procedure or whatever that might mean to your business, um, what should that process look like? Right. And then, and then apply some rules to it. And then once it is, then, then you test it out. Um, and when it works, the pain is relieved. You feel really great. You get a little hit of dopamine and the habit begins. Sort of. You have to implement <laughs> it. And that's the other, like, like, like a written out system or even better yet video is great. But un until it becomes an actual ritual, which I'd love to get into this conversation with Jason, until it becomes a ritual where people have actually implemented that in real life, into the field, right? Into the job site, into the um, at, at the office, at the at, at the shop, wh wh whatever it might apply to. Until it's implemented there, it's really not much use. So that I mean that that's a whole that's a whole separate conversation. Um, so anyway, th that that's been kind of my experience. The the key is you start with the lowest hanging fruit, and and to your point, it's not so much of a destination. It's it's a way of being. There are contractors that operate in a way of you know, let's, let's just fly by the seat of our pants. And then there's contractors that operate in a way of let's constantly be structuring and systemizing. So speaking to this, this, uh, idea of like, go to your pain points first. Um, one of the things Jason, that you invested in really heavily in, in this past season was this training program. So what, what was the pain point there? How did you identify that as like a, a, a need for your business? Yeah, honestly, uh, my brain was just like cooking as Igor was talking about that. Cause I can think of like so many different times that I've just identified like the different pain points and that's been right. what kicked off an implementation. This is a great example. Uh, the, the biggest problem that I ran into was like, I had these guys who were really good guys. They'd been with the business for, uh, you know, I've got some guys that are at 10, 11 years right now. They've been with our, our company. Wow. Um, and last year I was just kind of like really doing a deep dive on where we were at and um, realized that a lot of these guys who had been with us eight plus years were decent employees and, and pretty uh, like pretty knowledgeable. Um, but that's a lot of time to be spending on a trade. And, and I felt that like we all could have been doing better and that we could have, uh, our, our skill set should have been a lot greater than it was, including myself, honestly. Mm. Um, and I just, I wasn't sure how to get there. Uh, that was the biggest thing. I'm like, I, I feel like we're really struggling. And we had these guys who had been with us that just needed, needed that extra push and, and needed some sort of like structure um, to that. So we looked at like certification courses, things like that. The other thing I started noticing was that our general time to get like just a new technician in the doors and up and running um, to like basically 80% signed off on their kind of skill breakdown, which is what we expected as like kind of signed off, like, cool, this guy's like into his role now and he, he's doing well. It took us about a season, like a full season um, to get a new employee to that level. That's a very long time. And that's a pain point. That's a, that's yeah. a, that's a problem, right? Like it takes it's also very expensive. Totally. Yeah. So you're like right there. Okay. It's taking us 12 months to get somebody competent at running this set of equipment and doing this type of job. Exactly. Yeah. 
And it's, you know, that causes all sorts of other problems. Obviously there's the obvious problem of productivity not being where we need it to be, but you've also got crew leads who have a bit more experience who are working with those guys on their team to get them up to speed. They're getting frustrated. So then you're starting to have this kind of like just spiral out of control. So that's really how we identified uh, what the issue was and started diving into the fact that we just didn't really have any stand. We had some basic SOPs uh, to Igor's point. They weren't very well implemented. Uh, they were there, <laughs> but uh, they weren't very well implemented and we didn't really have a system for, uh, you know, when someone was even going to digest those SOPs and what that looked like. And then, uh, you know, how do we hold the crews accountable to uh, repeating that process out in the field to like, it's great that you just read through an SOP and even took a quiz on it, but like, how are you going to ensure that that happens the same way every time out in the field? And so we decided that uh, like a more formalized training program was really what we needed. And we took the plunge. Now, what I find so interesting about this build out is um, y- y- this was a very hands off process for you, it, like if I remember correctly. Like you, you really uh, empowered your team to do this with you, and it was some. It was very much an all hands on deck project. Now, less work for you, right? keeps your bandwidth free to focus on the bigger picture. That's huge. But more importantly, way better end product because this is being built by the people that are carrying out these tasks. They're bumping into these challenges every single day. So, how? I mean, that's really impressive. How did you get, like, how did you rally your forces in such a way to take this on and you sort of project manage it from a higher level? Yeah, it's, it's really the first project of that magnitude that... I wasn't uh, involved in on a day-to-day level. In fact, there were times where I, uh, people would ask me for kind of updates on where we're at with the training program. And I had to honestly answer, like, I've got no clue. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really involved in the build-up. So I, I'll, I'll have to check in on that and get back to you. So the key for us was starting, starting in chunks rather than just like, I admittedly I have had a tendency in the past to just kind of dump projects onto staff because I'm confident in their ability. And regardless of how skilled someone is um, or how much experience they have, if you kind of conceptualize something in your brain and then just dump it off on someone, it's really difficult for them to deliver on what (laughs) you expect out of that project. Uh, They're not mind readers. So we, the way we handled it with the training program was we took it in chunks. We started with just a skill breakdown. That's all we needed. We just needed a skill breakdown, meaning what, uh, what skills does, uh, did each role need to have? Um, that essentially becomes an SLP list. So, we Sorry, started just, as a I just group. want to clarify that really quick because that's, I think, really important to understand very tangibly. So give me an example of like, like a role in your landscaping business and what might be some of these elements of a skill breakdown. Absolutely. So for the, uh, let's just take like a very entry level role, a uh, technician out in the field. Uh, skill breakdown is definitely going to incru- include uh, the different pieces of equipment and how to operate that equipment safely. Um, in addition to that, it's going to include the breakdown, the SOP of like how we perform services with that equipment. Um, beyond that, we're going to have more like soft skills, uh, basic like customer communication because they're out in the field and there is a right. chance that they're going to run into a customer. Just everything that would go into needing to deliver that role. We even have a, a SOP on, uh, we call it the morning rollout. So where do I park my car when I arrive at work? Um, what do I do when I walk in the door? Um, what, what's the process for that? So totally. yeah, it's very interesting. So you're basically taking a role and almost like unbolting it and taking it apart into here, the different like elements that, that, that make up that, that role. Absolutely. Right. Yep. Yeah. And that was, that was really the first step. We did that as a group. So it was, like I said, it was our first time really involving um, the team as a whole in a, a large implementation item like this. So we started as a group meeting. We just uh, got everyone together and started breaking down. We wrote the roles up on a whiteboard and just started listing skills underneath it and came up with a skill list pretty quickly, actually. And it, it had a couple effects that I, were noticeable immediately. First of all, we had a skill list. So we had a list for building SOPs out. 
Um, and we had buy-in on the training program as a whole, which was really cool because now everyone was involved in that and everyone had a say and like, oh, I feel like that's more of like a crew lead responsibility. Like a crew lead needs to understand that, not a technician. So they were part of architecting the original sort of like, uh, like framework for this entire program. From there, we started uh, breaking it off more individually. So that was a group setting. Um, then we started kind of delegating tasks uh, to different members of the team. To your point that you made earlier, Benji, um, we delegated a lot of the SOPs uh, for like field work, how to operate a particular piece of equipment, how to perform a particular service to technician level roles, which felt like a big risk at the time. Um, are these guys really going to be able to create an SOP on this process? It felt like, uh, honestly, I was pretty skeptical about it at first. Mm-hmm. And the SOPs that I got back were better than the SOPs that I had previously built for those things. Cause yeah. those guys are doing it every single day. The, the, certainly like they could use some help, uh, through the process on like how to format an SOP, how we wanted to see that information presented. Um, so we actually created templates for that. That was, we learned our lesson after the first few that's like, oh, they just need, it's not the content they're struggling with. It's the format, how to present that content. So, which is easy. We, yeah. Totally. Did, did I, they, it took me did they enjoy it? Build a little, what's that? Did they enjoy it? Like what, like, was that a, like looking back on it, was it kind of a fun project? Did it make them feel a part of something bigger? Like they're, they're, they're putting their mark on the organization in a way. I'm, I'm wondering if that was like a, a cool learning process or s- something that, that uh, they enjoyed doing. Most definitely. We did a recap at the end of the year and just kind of had everyone list like their highlights from the year. And overwhelmingly that was a highlight for a lot of our staff, just being able to participate in that. A lot of our SOPs are better because like they injected humor into the SOPs. They like did a much better job than I would have just kind of listing, like do this and do this and do this and do this. Uh, there was a lot of humor played into it. A lot of the guys had fun with it. Um, and they're still doing it. Like that's just part of that training program will be growing forever. We're not done with it. We're going to be adding SOPs forever and improving SOPs forever. And it's actually built into the process. So in our platform where we house our SOPs, there's a feedback button for whoever's taking the SOP to offer feedback on the SOP itself. Mm-hmm. Is there some way that this can be improved? Is there some mm-hmm. way that maybe you're doing it differently in the field and, and this is something that works better for you? So it's just I, built into the, the process. Cool. That That's so neat. I want to highlight kind of one important point of just Benji to your question of like, you know, how much involvement did Jason have versus how much his team did? And we're talking about the involvement of the team. Um, to capture this point, it's important to not to swing too far that way too, because what I do hear a lot of with contractors is, well, I hired Nancy or Jim, and they're an amazing office manager, and they're going to go in, and they're going to build. They're good at Excel. They're good at Excel, yeah. or they're good at writing, they're good at Word, whatever, however you're yeah. building them, and they're going to do them. And I think that there's all some, as much as we're talking about, hey, like, get your team involved, it is also important to not swing too far that way because it is, these are, they are technicians, they're field workers, they're a plumber, they're whatever it is that you do. Um, you absolutely still have to be the one leading it. You have to be the one project managing it. You need to be the one doing the final writing or videoing or however you're, you're creating it, whether it's video, audio or written. Um, is still absolutely your job. It's your company. It's your procedures. It's your training program. So yes, you get input from your staff. Yes, you have their involvement, but it, it still ultimately sits on your shoulders. I, I think that is an important point to not swing too far that way. Uh, that's a really good point to make. And uh, y- you do see that where people expect, you know, I can just completely delegate the build out of and my it doesn't entire move business. Properly. It, do- it doesn't move properly. No. The, the, so the, the, the systems are not what the, the owner wants. That person gets totally overwhelmed with it. Totally, because they have a job. They're like, I just wanted, <laughs> I got that was as an office manager. Or you totally. brought me in as a whatever. And, and so, uh, yeah, that is definitely n- not a best practice as well. So it is fine. It is about finding that balance. Um, I so, something I would add to that really quick too is just something that I learned over the course of that training program specifically is to make sure that everyone involved in that process, specifically the ones who are kind of taking charge and taking ownership of that, understand the objective. It seems like such a simple thing, but like what is the end goal and the end objective of this training program? What are we trying to solve? Like back to the pain point, what are we trying to solve here? What is the purpose of this? 
Um, it seems like a very simple thing, but it was something that I kind of, I noticed through this process that I wasn't great at doing at the beginning and I got much better at doing over the course of that project. Yeah. If, if it, it would be like, if, you know, one of your team members who's involved in, in the creation of this training process can't in a couple sentences explain to you the reason why you're building the training program and how it fits into the organization, like strategically, then you, that's a problem. They're, they're going to build something that doesn't fit or doesn't work or whatever. I'm, I'm curious now that this is done and I'm not, and I'm not saying it's completely finished, but you, you've, you've done uh, a, a lot of heavy lifting early in the year and, and you have, you certainly have some semblance of a structure. Maybe we'll call it a V1 training program that we know will be added to in the future. But with what you have now in place, like, can you speak to maybe the two or three, uh, most obvious ways that that has improved your business? The most obvious one that comes to mind right out of the gates is goes back to what we were talking about, the time, the duration of time that it takes to get a new technician up to where we would consider signed off, like 80% signed off on all their skills. Uh, we went from taking an entire season uh, previously to when we did our first like V run, V one run through of this training program. Uh, the new technicians that we brought in and ran through this this formalized process were up and running in about two to three weeks. Uh, they were signed off on eighty percent. So we went from a full season to two to three weeks signed off on their skills and had. I mean, just to have a round of technicians come into the business and be up to speed that quick had it's it impacted the business as a whole crew leads were happier they were getting better guys out to the field by the time they got to them in the field they already had an understanding of the role and the equipment had run the equipment in a controlled environment it was it had a huge impact on the overall morale of our existing team and financially uh, obviously getting guys up and running uh in two weeks rather than the entire season had quite the impact as well. Our productivity um, kind of skyrocketed just even in that first run through. I, I suspect it's had a pretty big impact on widening your recruitment pool as well. Like you can, you can probably hire people with less experience. You're not relying on someone that's been a landscape for three years. You can bring somebody from a different industry, probably bring someone in younger and be totally confident that they can get their technical abilities where they need to be relatively quickly. So that's, that's absolutely, thing too. it's a big part of our plan this year, actually. Uh, it's one of the reasons why this training program was so important to us. We realized that in our business, it's really important for us to be able to scale up and then thin out um, at different times of the year. And right. so we are, we have gone to using uh, what we call like a casual labor list. Um, Mostly it's people from my internal network, especially over this last year, uh, people who maybe have a job, have a part-time job, or just looking for work here and there. Uh, for me personally, a lot of them are musicians from the music scene here in Denver who are back from tour and need some work for a couple of weeks. Um, and so what we do is we run this list of people, anyone who's interested in good work, we run them through the training program. They have to get certified in the training program. Once they're signed off, they're added to this casual labor list. And when we need extra help, when we need to scale up very quickly, we send out a mass email and text message to everyone on that list who wants work. And suddenly we've got a pool of laborers available um, um, to scale up very quickly. That's really interesting. So everyone listening that runs a seasonal business, this is huge because like you need to swell to a certain size very, very in like a month when, yeah. the, when the weather gets warm. And then you need to be able to, compress when you move into the cold season so you're in denver this is obviously a huge thing for you this comes up all the time people like i want to hire somebody but i'm only going to need him for six months and and you know having this uh having this infrastructure in place has obviously made that a way easier problem to solve for you guys Totally. And just to bring a, a bit of tangibility to it, just for a really quick minute, Jason, uh, can you just describe for, for viewers what this thing actually looks like? Like I've visually seen it. So you, you've got all this stuff is built into a system, right? And in there is like they go through modules within the software of like written content, video content. So you just spend one quick minute painting the picture of what it looks like. Absolutely. So that first part of the training uh, program is our online training portal. And when we, let's just take it from the perspective of like a new hire. As soon as we hire a new hire and we onboard them, one of the first things that happens 
is they get assigned um, what we call paths, learning paths. Um, and these are really just a series of SOPs um, that are housed in this online portal. So you're absolutely right. It's a combination of text, video, um, photos, and diagrams. But it's really just a, a simple SOP taking you through a process. At the end of every SOP, uh, we have a short quiz um, that uh, basically just tests the retention, the knowledge there. And then at the end of each path, we have a more involved quiz. Um, it's a requirement to proceed that you have to score an 80% or better to proceed from that point on. Um, so it acts as a filter for us as well. Um, so once you've completed the online training and you hit that 80%, um, you get cleared to move into the next phase of our training program, which is called sandbox training. Sandbox training is just a controlled environment training. So it's time on the tools, it's time doing uh, like actual services, providing actual services, mowing the yard, aerating the lawn, uh, laying fertilizer at our shop. So we've built out a sandbox area at our facility um, where it's very you know low stress. Uh, guys can get a feel for the equipment, uh, and we take them through the basically through the process of a normal day. Um, so the very first part of Sandbox is they're going to go through the morning huddle, the morning check-in. They're going to see exactly what a day is going to look like. Our team captains, we actually have roles built out to kind of lead this process. Our team captains run this. And uh, at the end of the day, you are essentially assigned a, a pass or fail grade. And uh, it's, again, it's another filter point at that point. So the team captains um, have very clear SOPs on how to score this. They're using the Doragi model. So uh, they're you know demonstrating the skill, observing the skill. Uh, everyone talks about it as a group and kind of gives feedback on how that person performed. Uh, it's really, we found it to be a very effective way of learning um, very quickly too. Um, and once you have passed that that sandbox training, it's kind of uh, like a bit of a ceremony at the end of the day. That's when you get like your uh, your logoed up gear, you get your hat, you get some swag, uh, and we kind of have a like a welcome party at the end of the sandbox. We're going to start working in like barbecues, uh, things like that at the end of this event. And it's really like a, you know, congratulations, welcome to the team. Um, and you're cleared to enter field training at that point. Field training, uh, all of that information that the team captain gathered from the sandbox training and from your online training now gets passed off to your crew lead and his weekly GSR is one of the reasons why GSR is so important for us. And uh, the crew lead is now kind of taking ownership and helping to uh, move that technician um, further down the path and they're incentivized to do so. So um, it, there's, there's a process for kind of moving up. We allow all of our employees to dictate how quickly they move up at our company. So it's really just based on how quickly are you getting signed off on your skills um, and uh, meeting certain benchmarks. So we have benchmarks that are tied to our core values in there as well. But as soon as you've signed all those off and checked the boxes, you're no longer a tech level one, you're a tech level two, and you just got a dollar an hour raise. You can move up into the next tier from there. So it's very like uh, self-driven. Um, and we've added some fun little incentives in there along the way as well. Like our crew leads get an incentive every time someone on their team advances to a new level. So they're incentivized to help uh, everyone uh, drive up through that process as well. Jason, that's awesome, man. That's such a good bit. Thank you for describing that. I want to highlight one kind of important piece around what, what Jason said is if you think about your role as a leader in a, in, in a business, in a contracting business, um, if you are to grow long term, and I'm thinking big picture here, right, you have to, as a leader, create an environment and a process where people can get skilled up relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to grow, you're going to need more people, right? That's how we work in the contracting mm -hmm. business. We can't grow without people doing more stuff. It's, it's, it's a labor at the end of the day. And, um, and so there, there's this key element that you must get in place as a leader, which is how can I get my people, new people skilled up more quickly and how can I scale up my existing people to take the higher level roles to make room for new people coming in. And some of these things that Jason just spoke to in the last couple of minutes 
are so important, right? How do we systemize and structure training? How do we create test environments to be able to test people? How do we certify people that, yes, you're competent in certain skills? How do we celebrate that with them to create a culture of improvement, of moving up in the company, right? And and that, I think, is something that we don't maybe necessarily always keep front of mind but but perhaps should because if you want to grow like you have that has to be part of your repertoire and it, and it goes right down to the level of the individual that individual wants to grow as well so they need to see the totally. path in front of them so okay i'm just going to be a technician this year but if i if i actually get through all these competency models and i become you know really good at this role then i can move into a crew lead and then i can move into this like they need to see the ceiling be high and there's there's room for them to grow as well and that's what i think you know i've i've seen your your you know, your software and how all this is built like from the perspective of a new employee they, they look at this go holy smokes i'm going to be here for a while well l- look at how long he's keeping people exactly right like that wouldn't be the case you're not going to hire high performers who want to stay around a long time if there's no developmental path 100%. if you've not set up the environment for them to grow right you're always going to be capped at that kind of labor so if you're sitting there asking yourself why am i hired keep hiring these kind of these kind of people and uh there's probably an element of this in there. hundred percent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So awesome. Good. Benji, let's talk about sales. Yeah, this is, I, I want to, I, I want to get into this cause I just think this is one of the coolest things I've heard. So, I mean, I have Igor, you have, I think we all have just spent hours and hours and many, many weekends and even evenings, you know, in, on driveways, in yards, looking at houses, giving quotes, trying to do deals. I spent a few hours. It that way. is a grind. And Jason, in all his brilliance, has figured out a way to not do that anymore or certainly do a lot less of it. So tell us about how you've automated your sales process over the past uh, year. It's been, it's just a f- fascinating project. This is uh, this goes back to a pain point, right? Like you're absolutely right about the pain point. I really struggled with the fact that I we do a mix of residential and commercial services. I should preface by saying that. And we... I found that I was spending 80 is the old 80, 20 rule. Like I was spending 80% of my time selling 20% of our revenue. I was, you know, I I was sitting on site at residential homes, um, you know, pricing out a job that in the end was going to be worth maybe a thousand bucks or, or a couple thousand bucks. Um, and a lot of time went into building those proposals and to, uh, the back and forth in the sales part, just communicating with the client, especially on the residential level, because at that job size, it's a volume game. We need a lot of those jobs um, to really make it worth our while, especially when you also have a commercial division and you're looking at like, oh, I just sold one of those jobs and that is like 20 of these these smaller jobs. Like the frustration just builds there. I bet. Um, and it did for me. So. We, we really wanted to automate our process. The first thing we did is we automated our one-off uh, services. So this is like a la carte services that are super low average job size. Um, it's like an aeration, a fertilization, a sprinkler winterization, those one-off services. Um, for us, it's maybe a hundred bucks for that service. A lot of contractors will say it's hardly even worth it to do those services. Um, the way we automated that, that was the first project. And that was actually something that we did a long time ago. Um, it was something that I I actually didn't even own the company yet when we tackled that. And we just implemented an online scheduler that was client facing. So the client comes in, they select their zip code because density is really important when you're trying to build volume like that. They select their zip code, they select their service. It only shows them availability for their particular zip code because we pre-built the availability out. They schedule and they pay online and it's taken care of. So in that process, literally no one has to touch the sales process. They, the, we focus more on uh, top of the funnel stuff with that, just driving people to that scheduler. Um, so we focus a lot on marketing, email uh, campaigns, that sort of stuff. And we just drive people to the schedule, they schedule that service. Um, the frustration, so that was really cool to get that going and, and we felt really good about it. We also knew that that was our foot in the door. That's why we did those smaller services. It was our foot in the door to potentially um, sign that customer up for a recurring service, which was a higher value service. And and, uh, we were very eager to do that, but we were hitting a ceiling because again, I was the only person providing these bids. I had to go out and run the entire sales process. And so that was what we decided to tackle last year is automating the recurring service sales. The first thing that we did 
was we uh, we changed our pricing structure entirely. <laughs> um, we created more of a bucket system rather than like a, each yard is going to get an individual quote um, based on just my <laughs> Previously, it was just based on my knowledge. Like I would just look at a yard and be, yeah, that's about a, I don't know, a $30 a week yard. That's a $50 a week yard. Really not a consistent way of bidding. <laughs> and uh, so we created a bucket system that was based on square footage of turf. Um, and so it, it, it's, you know, it's not every yard is getting an individual quote. They're thrown into a bucket. And what I mean by that is it's uh, priced in tiers. Like a thousand to two thousand square foot yard is priced at this amount. A two thousand to five thousand square foot yard is priced at this amount. And what we found is working off of averages like that, the amount of time that it saves to bid uh, makes up for the fact that you might be making a little less margin on those jobs that sit on the higher side of that tier. Um, and it, it, it all averages out in the end because the majority of the jobs you're going to get sit on the lower side of that tier. So yeah. it's it's just been a, a huge help with that. So um, that's, that was the first step in that process. That's just um, smart. That's just <laughs> smart. So is it an interesting comment? And now this does really apply mainly to what we might call like low average job mm -hmm. size services. So this certainly doesn't apply to your, if you're a GC to your construction company, but, <laughs> but I think for any of these call it like sub $1,000 average job size services, um, I think this is a very interesting thing to think about. Now, I remember many years ago as developing a company, which is now huge in all over North America, Shackshine. And um, I remember we did a ton of market research at the beginning, talking to other companies in that space. So what we kind of coined house detailing, but it was this window cleaning, gutter cleaning, pressure washing world that Shackshine really revolutionized. And you know, we had, we had we had the same house that we had quoted on over and over and over again by other window and gutter cleaning companies. And I was watching with the detail that like, so they would send someone out, sometimes the owner to quote it and he'd spend quite a bit of time there and we'd chit chat and we had the same house quoted like 15 times to understand a bit about like how competitors pricing works. And every single time the competitor the 2B competitor would come and quote it and spend like 45 minutes there plus the drive time. I was like, this is insane. This is like a $500 job. And, and we came to the same logic and it went like small shack, medium shack, large shack, right? Buckets. Buckets, right? And, and people were like, well, that's crazy. Like what your pricing is going to be off. And, but at mass scale, it doesn't, it, averages it, it out. didn't, it averaged out. It didn't end up mattering. Right. So anyway, that, that, I think that's a point mainly for, uh, services that fall in this uh, no, low average job size group, but it, okay. it, it is something interesting to think about. And the other thing that, that's cool, and this was a really heads up play by you, Jason, because you very could have, you very easily could have just discarded that. You could just say, well, we're not going to do jobs that small. It's just not worth our time. That's what a lot of people can and do say. And, right. but what you miss by doing that is like, there's a huge amount of brand building that goes on with these small you know, rinky dink jobs, so to speak. You, you, like you said, you get in the door, you build some rapport, they know your name, they know your brand. Well, they're and recurring. one day, totally, and one day they actually are going to have like a much larger project to give you or they are going to refer you to their buddies. So it's, um, yeah, like now this is where this sort of sales automation is such an interesting loophole because you've, you've gotten the best of both worlds. You've maintained the brand uh, recognition. You're, I'm sure you're still making a little bit of profit off those jobs, but the big thing is like, you're not out there freezing your buns off, like looking at somebody's front yard going, it's going to be $600. Especially in Denver. Right. Yeah. Especially yeah, in Denver. Yeah. yeah. The entire process now. It, so first of all, I should, I should say that I'm not even involved in the sales process for residential anymore. We just successfully handed that off to our first uh, sales rep and estimator um, that is now 100% running the residential side. It took us all of, I'd say, about two days all in to get her completely trained up on the entire sales process and how to sell because of how automated it is. Her role uh, basically is we drive leads into the funnel and uh, it, I, I won't break down every step of the way, but basically we drive leads into the funnel in our sales CRM it creates a task for her and that task is the, really the only manual process in the entire sales uh, cycle for the residential side, which is go online and measure the yard, measure the turf. Um, we're, I should say that we're going to have that step of the process automated here this year as well. Um, but right now someone has to physically go online. They measure the turf from an aerial view. As soon as they measure that, they input 
again, what bucket it falls into, um, into our CRM, and it automatically sends a quote out to that client. So the client gets the quote uh, via email, um, and they enroll in a follow-up sequence. So if they have not clicked the link in there to select the package they'd like, they're going to get a follow-up email. Um, they're going to get, we use different uh, avenues, so they'll get a follow-up text as well. Um, and then eventually they may get a task created for our sales rep to call them as well if they if they need a little assistance moving down the pipeline. Uh, but that's it. That's really the entire involvement of the sales rep. Measure the yard. If it gets to the point where they need a follow-up call, give them a call. Um, and uh, it's increased the amount of bids that we can turn out. Like, we're actually in the middle of a sprint right now to uh, get as many residential recurring sales done as we can. We have 1,600 leads in our pipeline, and in the last two days, uh, I think we've knocked out like 900 bids or something like that. So, uh, so cool. And that includes follow-up calls, uh, sending the actual quotes. So it's, all, yeah. it's all being automated. So cool. I want to just interject with with a, with a very interesting point to ponder. Um, we're talking about systemization, applying structure, applying a lot of automations. We work in such an antiquated industry where this stuff isn't commonplace, right? And when you look at Jason's business, like a cut above is so far above, so to speak. So many other landscaping companies in the, in this space, and and we know hundreds of amazing contracting businesses that are so far above their competition because they create they've created these systems and processes and automations to like really elevate the customer experience to a whole other level. But in other industries, this stuff is commonplace, but not in ours, right? So when you think about like the implementation of SOPs, like standardized operating procedures, what does a pilot do at American Airlines when they, they don't, they don't like wing it through the startup <laughs> process and the takeoff process themselves? There's checklists and processes for everything. What is a surgeon doing at the beginning of a procedure? Everything's structured, right? And, and it's really our industry that, that, that lags behind. And I think there's just so much, if you are an evolved contractor that thinks through these things and, and, and put some focus to them, there's so much opportunity to, to, uh, blaze past the competition because it's, it's pretty weak on, on this front. Yeah. It's, that's starting to change. Like we're, change. we're, you know, we're, we're kind of seeing that, uh, more and more every month, every year, like, like customers are getting smarter and these systems are getting better and and you know what yeah may, maybe it was antiquated but but i bet you 10 years from now it, this is the direction it's it's all gonna go totally. and, and being on the front edge of that wave is certainly advantageous i'm 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 very curious jason like um the sales process did you did you collaborate was it like i I, th I think you connected with another another landscaping business uh another bta member to sort of like compare notes and and, and build this out so I'd, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the role that collaborating with another like-minded entrepreneur played in this implementation absolutely I, i'll start uh, before i get to like the collaboration with the other landscape company uh the initial collaboration as far as the sales process goes started with a buddy of mine who came from a background in the tech space and, uh, and owns his own marketing firm. And he said exactly what Igor just said, which is like, he came into the space, he took a look, look at it. He's like, this is really how you're providing bids. Like you're calling a person on the phone and going to their house. This is like, this is how you're doing it. It's ridiculous. And so we, we collaborated on kind of building this process out similar to like, we're selling tech basically. That's kind of, we joked that that's like, a lot of our processes are very similar down to like creating packages that you could select for your landscape services. Like that's one of the first things we did was just creating like a very simple, like you can have this package, this package, this package, and we branded them based on time saving. So it's the kickback package, the rest easy package or the total freedom package. Uh, so that was a really cool collaboration. It gave me a lot of insight into how other industries are doing it and just, you know, how antiquated our industry uh certainly can seem at times for sure. Um, and then, yeah, is it in regards to kind of further collaboration, we partnered with, we actually started partnering with this other business, uh, another BCA member, Landscapers by Nature. Um, we just kind of, we've known each other for a few years. We hit it off. We have very similar businesses. We've always kind of traded like stories and information. Um, he's, Brandon has been a huge help in like, when I'm stuck on something, he's like, oh, I tried that once. Like, here's a SOP I came up with and we'll send it off. And it's been really helpful for me. 
So we started our collaboration actually on the training program. Both our businesses went in on the training program together. Uh, we split the breakout of SOPs up and, uh, you know, some of his team created SOPs, some of my team created SOPs. And we found that our businesses are so similar that we were able to get away with that. Like we, we were able to kind of trade SOPs in that way. For the training process, Brandon saw what we did on the residential side and he doesn't do residential. He focuses primarily on condos or strata. Um, and he thought, you know, this would be really cool to be able to do this uh, for what for our sales process as well or something similar. Um, so it, that was actually our next step because we needed to build out our commercial process and standardize that since we had done the residential. So we actually flew into Calgary, uh, stayed there for a little over two weeks and just did a deep dive. We built, uh, it was actually a really fun experience. We got an Airbnb and turned it into what we were calling the war room, had like, I think, 12 different 12 or 13 different computers in this space with all of our team uh brought jonathan my buddy from uh the tech side of things who now is actually a, a member of our team and uh just like dove into this process and same thing started with their pricing model like what's your pricing look like let's go through that branded their packages uh went through every step of the way and just like really systemized the build out of this uh this process and really, we feel like we've got it pretty dialed now. It's going to be something that's ever evolving. But the amount of work that we were able to get done in just that like little over two-week time by collaborating and by putting all of our heads together and getting in the same place was really something special to see. Like it was, uh, it's something that uh, I hope that we get to do again. And probably a ton of fun. Oh yeah, it was awesome. It was great. Yeah, I bet you guys had we, a blast. This is another key, like. Yeah, we, th that's such an interesting point, right? Like, th speaking of antiquated kind of trends in this industry, in, in other industries, it is, it'd be way more common to collaborate with other companies in the space. I mean, contractors historically don't do that a ton, but this kind of evolved way of this, this much more efficient way to do it is, is to look at what are other companies in the space doing and to collaborate with them. I mean, it's, it's so cool. Now your example is kind of interesting. There's a fellow Breakthrough Academy member that's thousands of miles away, in fact, in a different country in Canada, but, um, to look at a similar business and say like, what can we learn from each other? And to do it as well, all tech companies do is, is, is do stuff in sprints where you sit down and you just hyper focus on something for a week, for 10 days, whatever. And, and just, and punch something out is, is also a very neat application to this. There's some underlying wisdom there that everyone can take though. It's, it's and it, you don't need to fly to Calgary to like get the benefits of collaborating with someone like, if, if you run a painting business, if you run a construction company, if you run a landscaping business, like a, like whatever, and there's somebody in your town that you admire and you think runs a good shop, like pick up the phone and call them. Be like, hey, can I buy you lunch? I just want to like pick your brain. You'd be blown away at how open most people are to talking about this stuff. This sort of old boys club where everyone's siloed off and nobody wants to share their trade secrets and they're terrified of their competitors. Like, you know, you go to the paint store and people are like, totally. Oh, like get that guy away from me. <laughs> like that, like who, who is that serving? Totally. Nobody. And, and it's a roofing company, dude. This is not it, like, like the code <laughs> behind Netflix. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Like it's like you guys can, you guys can share notes and the reality is you're both going to be better off the market will be better off. Like it's just, I, I really a admire um, people that, that sort of have that approach towards other people in their state. You guys are on the same path. You're, you're, you're fighting the same fight. Like get together and talk about it. You may totally. be able to learn something. Totally. This, uh, uh, that sales process I will say is so much better than if the alternative, if we would have just hunkered down and worked on it ourselves for our own company. Um, yeah. Like we put a lot of work into helping, another company build out their sales process. And in turn, we got a ton of value out of it. There were things that I never would have thought of or seen in our sales process. That was just very simple to them. They're like, well, why are you doing it that way? Why don't you just do it this way? I'm like, oh, yeah. right. Makes perfect sense. That really is, um, we're, we're, we're talking about just yesterday, we were joking around like um, analogies to kind of like history and big picture life stuff. I mean, I mean, come back to that. This is the hallmark of the human mind. Is it not? Like what separates us from highly successful animals? Like what separates you from a grizzly bear? You're not stronger, more powerful. You don't have more endurance. What you have is a mind to collaborate with language. other humans yeah. and, and like language, right? That's what's made 
the, the homo sapien, the most successful species this planet has ever seen. And it's our ability to collaborate with other people. Um, so we should use it sometimes. I agree. Um, Jason, I want to switch gears here. I want to talk about um, implementation of this. So creating great, good, great systems. So you go to see Brandon Comstock at Landscapers by Nature. You guys create amazing training programs, SOPs, sales processes. It's written. It's it's done in video. It's all in this beautiful software. Um, that, that That's all great. Um, if it's not implemented into the day-to-day -day of your business, it's useless. It's just it's inside software. Um can you tell me a bit about like this other half of the battle around adoption? How do you drive adoption of these great systems and processes and, and actually implement this into the day-to-day? -day? How do you do that? That's the hardest part. Totally. <laughs> like, I think I the build-out <laughs> the build out's a lot of work, but it's not particularly difficult once you have the direction. Um, the adoption is difficult. Um, and it's something that, honestly, I think we're still honing in and we're still really like dialing in our processes for um for kind of achieving that adoption quicker um but we're getting there and, and a couple of things that we found really useful in that process uh, the training program is a big one to figure out like uh, to help us kind of figure out how to make sure that you've just created thousands of sops like i said that's great that they went through the training program but if no one's following them in the field then it was useless mm -hmm. um so a few things that we do, we, um, we tie it back, first of all, always, no matter what the system is, no matter what we have just implemented, we always, whoever we're communicating it to, we try to tie it back to the why again, the objective. Why, why are we doing this and why is it important? And more importantly, like how and why is it important to you in your role? Why does it matter to you? Uh, because if we can't clearly communicate that, then it's going to be really tough to get any sort of adoption. That's just what we found. Um, beyond that, uh, we've we've experimented with a few different things. Uh, one thing that we've started adopting here uh, just last year is um, basically when we finish an implementation item or a sprint, uh, we, we actually call them sprints because we've adopted that from the tech side of things as well. When we finish a sprint, um, no matter who ran that sprint, because uh, now we're doing it in teams, if it was the operations team or the office team, the last step of that sprint all, always is a debrief to the leadership team. So they need to present to the leadership team um, from all divisions uh, of what they just accomplished, what they did, any highlights and milestones from that implementation item, any key things that we all need to know and how they fit into each different division in the company why it's important to each different division in the company. So we start there, and now we've got buy-in from the leadership staff across the board. Um, once we've done that, oftentimes what we'll do is if it's a more like uh, like a process, a live process is, that's going to be run, before we roll it out to the whole team, we'll test it with the leadership team. Because now, a lot of times, our office manager is just being clued into this thing that the operations team just did. She knew it was happening, but this is the first time she's really seeing it tangibly. So she's a great candidate to test the process out. She has no previous experience with it. So uh, let's run her through it and see if she can follow the process uh, based on how you've laid it out. So um, we do kind of those trial runs with the leadership team. We found that to be really useful. Um, and then we'll do uh, sometimes segmented rollouts uh, for the rest of the team as well. So with our training program, the first group of people that we ran through the training program was actually our existing staff. Uh, we had crew leads who were taking technician modules and going through the technician process um, and doing technician sandboxes, um, but it allowed us to gather a lot of feedback on that process and make some corrections before we rolled it out to truly like new employees coming into it for the first time. Right. So and those have been some good tools that we found really useful in the rollout and the adoption. I, the last thing that just popped into my head that's been crucial is setting a focus after a rollout. If we just rolled something out, um, we make sure to highlight that as a focus in our daily stand-up meetings, our GSRs. That, that's what we're talking about and checking in on and putting some accountability to for at least the next couple of weeks. Um, if we just implemented a sales process, we're going to be checking in on those sales KPIs as a group, even if you're not directly related to that sales process. In the leadership meetings, we're going to be checking in on that process for the next two to three weeks um, so that 
there's another layer of accountability there and it becomes habit. Building habit is what we're really after. So it's just like, it becomes second nature. Totally. Yeah, that, that consistent focus after the rollout, in my experience, is really, really important, especially if, if you're implementing a whole bunch of this stuff. It can be a little bit, I guess you could say, taxing to the organization because there's currently there's certain ways that every organization does stuff. And if you're going to change those rituals and those habits, one, you need to put consistent focus to it, but you do have to kind of balance this line. I don't think most people are in danger of this, but there's also too much implementation, right? You can't be constantly changing mm-hmm. stuff. It's, it, 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 it is taxing in a way, but, um, when you do create a good system, you think through it, you test it and you go to implement it. Um, you do need to put quite a bit of focus to actually making sure that that becomes a, like a core ritual in the day-to-day operations. Absolutely. Another thing that we've found really effective is you can almost always identify a KPI um, that this particular process or system is meant to improve. Like typically that's why we're, we're doing this. Um, And so uh, as the, excuse me, as the final step of this, uh, the sprint or the rollout of this implementation item, it's making sure that we have a really dialed way to track that KPI and make it a focus during our normal meetings because nothing will get buy-in and adoption quicker than seeing tangible results. So if the the objective of the training program was how quickly we can get technicians up to like their certified level, then make sure that we're measuring that and that we're talking about it in our daily meetings and building a scoreboard for it. We're big on scoreboards. So uh, we want them to be able to track that everyone, uh, whether it's a technician, a crew lead, no matter where they're at in the company, we want them to be able to look at a glance and see whether what we did worked or not. Um, and both is it, both are important. If it's having a positive impact, then great. But if it's not working, that's just as important. We mm-hmm. need to think about something else and, and pivot a bit. So good. Jason, th- there's like, a hundred gold nuggets in here. I don't even know where to begin. Uh, so much value you've just shared between the training program, the sales process, how to sort of diagnose your own business and, and, and go about starting down this path. I want to end on a really open-ended uh, question here, which is just like, what advice would you have for a young entrepreneur who wants to systemize their business, who, who wants to step out of the day-to-day, who doesn't want to be bogged down in operational details from now until the end of their career. So someone who, who maybe has that desire, who has that spark within them, but is uh, intimidated or just not sure where to start, what, what would you tell them? It's a very loaded question. I feel like uh, I'm, putting I'm you on probably going to... <laughs> I'm probably so I just finished reading Extreme Ownership, so it was bound to come out at some point during this uh, this podcast. But Jocko, yeah. Once absolutely. you read Jocko, you can't not talk about Jocko. Everybody knows that. It's like so the floor I'm is yours. About. Yeah, let's hear it. <laughs> so uh, I would say the first thing is, as Jocko would say, prioritize and execute. So um, prioritizing at the beginning is super, super important. We talked about it at the top of the podcast, like identify the things that are going to have the highest impact for you um, and free up some of your time. Because at the beginning, it does not make sense to just dump stuff off onto someone else. You're not going to be able to just hire an office manager Mm -hmm. and give them this implementation item and they're going to run with it. You need to put a bit of work in on the front end and it's going to pay off tenfold on the back end. So um, uh, that's what I experienced. So prior to prioritizing in that way, um, for me, it was, I needed to get out of running the day-to-day operations. Uh, I needed to not be involved in that process every single day. So I focused on improving our efficiency in the field. Um, that was a big pain point for us. Um, I created an incentive structure for our guys so that they were operating more efficiently. Um, And then I focused on those things that could free up some more time for me so that I could then create a new role, which was operations manager. I worked someone from the field up into the operations manager role and was able to get him trained up fairly quickly, um, work alongside him and make sure that he understood that objective and that why that we were working to. And then only once I had done that and once he was comfortable with it, start involving him in these implementation items and getting him involved in that process. I did the same thing on the office side. I was doing the day-to-day with the operations side, running operations. I was also answering all the phones, sending all the invoices. Um, And so I did the same thing over there. 
um, just focused on the big items. Like, could I automate something to make my make it so that I'm spending less time on it? Or could I just systemize it so that I could easily train someone else to do it? Um, and then kind of just chunked off that way until finally I was able to get an office manager in there, um, have her up to speed on running those processes and then tackling her own implementation items. So I prioritized in that way to just slowly start peeling things off my plate. Then once I had that really like awesome team in place um, and had created a little bit of buy-in on this process, then I started practicing what Jocko would call decentralized command. Um, so that's tough. Like it's, it was really tough for me at first because now I'm the one who had done all these things. I'm the one who had got the ball rolling and now I needed to uh, delegate and therefore kind of let go and trust that other members of our team could handle this stuff. As long as I clearly communicated the objective and as long as we had a process for it. Um, and so that became really powerful. And I feel like we really just like, kind of hit that point this last year with the training program and the sales uh, process implementation where we're like really starting to uh, put that into practice and get deep practice with that decentralized command. And, uh, you know, I could go on and on about the different things that are important with that, but really it just comes down to like objective, making sure that they understand the objective and not just dumping. Like you still got to check in regularly. You still got to be involved in the process, remind people of that objective throughout the process um, but that, those are, those have been the key things for us, I would say. Dude, I want to thank you for, for doing this with us. Um, this has just been like a ton of fun between like prepping and shooting and like, it's just, it's always a blast hanging out with you. Um, I, I wish this could have been in person and, and, uh, uh, one day, one, one day. Yeah, the, the, the episode two with you w will be done uh, live for sure. But um, I just want to yeah, send out some sincere get gratitude for, for you taking the time to do this with us. Absolutely. I really, truly appreciate it. And uh, I appreciate everything you guys have done as well. Like I've said this a million times, um, but there's no way that we would have got any of this stuff done if we didn't find DTA. Like it's the whole reason that we started implementing this change. So really truly appreciate that and the community that you built like we talked a lot about brandon but there's like a million other entrepreneurs that i've connected with and collaborated with on all these different things so appreciate that thank you guys for that awesome thanks jason thanks and talk to you soon buddy thank you hey if you enjoyed this show hit that subscribe button it's what allows us to produce more awesome content for you totally for free